Okay, let's start our Friday morning lecture. Uh, we learned Laplace transform, uh, which is an extension of the Fourier transform we learned before from the pure imaginary uh, variable j omega to a general complex number s, which has a real part sigma, so s equals sigma plus j omega. And the motivation for Laplace transform is that, <coughs> is that the Fourier transform for continuous time signals does not always exist. Uh, in some cases, due to the failure of calculating a uh, integral. Uh, so as the integration upper limit goes to plus infinity, the integral may fail to converge. Then we need Laplace transform to get a a generalized frequency domain representation of the uh, signal. So this is the definition of Laplace transform, x of t exponential minus st dt. <coughs> Sorry. And then the Laplace transform has a very similar property with the Fourier transform uh, when it is uh, represented in the LTI system. So if we have input exponential st, then the output y of t can be represented as a function h of s times exponential st, or h of s, which is called the eigenvalue of the LTI system for a particular S is indeed the uh, Laplace transform of small h of t, the unit impulse response. And last lecture, we derived an important property that in the S domain, the out output of LTI system capital Y of S is capital H of S times X of S. So the slide uh, in the last lecture was not made very well. So I uh, revised the slides and uh, let's go through it together. So the first step of the derivation is still the same. Uh, the Laplace transform of y of t, uh, we replace y of t with its standard definition of uh, convolution. Right? Y of t is a convolution of h and x and the convolution is indeed an integral over tau. And there is a parameter t in the inner integration, uh, color coded as red. And then we can write this term exponential minus st inside the inner integration. Actually, because exponential minus st, the t is irrelevant to tau, it doesn't matter if you put this term inside or outside this inner integration. But after we split as two terms, uh, both terms containing tau, we must put it inside. So the multiplication of the two terms is exponential s minus st, so that the second line and the first line are equal, but because it contains, both terms contains tau, we need to put both terms inside the inner integration, okay. And then we can flip the inner integration over d tau outside and put the original outside integration over dt inside. So now the inner integration is over dt, outer integration is over d tau. And for the inner integration, everything associated with t need to be put inside, including x of t minus tau, it contains a t. Exponential minus s of t minus tau, it contains a t, so we need to put both of them inside. And the result of this integration, so after calculating the integration, the t will disappear, and the result will be a function of tau, right? So in the inner integration, tau is a parameter, dt is the integration variable. So what's inside the black square brackets is a function of tau. 
So we have h of tau exponential minus s tau, some function of tau d tau, which is the outside integration. So we are still OK at this step. Then let's check that everything is copied down h of tau, x of t minus tau. This term is copied down, this term is copied down. So we are not losing anything. Okay. And then this is the substitution. We can replace dt with d t minus tau because for the inner integration, the integration is over t. So we just add minus tau to t, which is, uh, which is like adding a constant deviation to the integration variable. It does not change the result of the integration. And then at the next step, we replace, but notice that at this step, the inner integration is still embedded inside the outer integration because the result still depends on tau. It's a function of tau, so we need to be put in the outer integration over tau. And then we substitute t minus tau with a new variable r. So r, r everywhere, replacing t minus tau. At the same time, we need to replace, uh, change the upper lower limit of the integration because we are changing dt to d. We are changing the integration variable from t to r then we need to add a constant uh, calibration minus tau. But because it's minus infinity to plus infinity, so the minus tau does not matter. It's still minus infinity to plus infinity. But this replacement enables us to completely split the inner and outside the outer integration because now the inner integration is over R. And the result of inner integration is only dependent on s. It no longer depends on tau. In other words, this replacement enables us to make the inner integration independent of tau so that we can split it out. So we have two split integrations. The first integration is the definition of Laplace transform for small h. The second integration is the definition of Laplace transform for small x and they are denoted by capital H and capital X respectively. Okay. I hope this explanation is clearer than what I made last the lecture. Okay. And then we look at several examples of Laplace transform. Uh, from these examples, we summarize those uh, observations. Say we have a right-sided exponential signal, then the region of convergence of the Laplace transform is to the right of the pole. Or the, the pole is the value of s, the point of s that makes the denominator of x s zero. If x is left-sided integration, uh, left-sided signal, then the arrows, the region of convergence is to the left of the pole. So there is a correspondence between this left and left, right and right. And another observation is that if the absolute integral of the time domain signal is infinite, then the region of convergence does not cover the pure imaginary axis and the Fourier transform does not exist. Or vice versa, if the integration is finite, then the region of convergence covers the imaginary axis and the Fourier transform exists. Because Fourier transform is the special case when S takes value on this imaginary axis. In other words, S equals J omega. These are the important observations from the examples last lecture. And we also look at more complicated examples associated with the sine, the cosine signals, uh, unit in power signals, and this kind of uh, truncated exponential signals. Okay. And for this last example, I mentioned that we can show continuity of this expression even on the point S equals minus one that makes the denominator zero. 
uh, but the, I made a mistake and now I correct it in the updated slides. So this is the last chapter, the uh, last lecture. At this lecture, let's continue studying a set of properties for Laplace transform. Okay. The first property is the linearity. Actually, it's very similar to the linearity property we learned for Fourier series and the Fourier transform. We have two continuous time signals whose Laplace transforms are respectively capital X and capital Y. And for Laplace transform, we always need to specify its region of convergence. So for X, the region of convergence we denote it by R1. So R1 is just a subset on the complex plane, on the 2D plane. And for Y, the region of convergence is denoted by R2. Then linearity property tells us that if we have a new time domain signal, a of x t plus b of y t, b y of t, then Laplace transform of this new signal is a capital X plus b capital Y. And the, Laplace, the region of convergence for this new Laplace transform, here we didn't determine it, but one thing we can uh, for sure to say is uh, the region of convergence contains R1 intersecting R2. So it means R ROC can be exactly R1 intersecting R2, or it might be a set that is larger than and contains R1 intersecting R2 as a strict subset. So both cases are possible. Let's show this with uh, examples. Okay, a question before we look at the example. Uh, then with the set may be open or closed. Hmm. This is a good question. Uh, I mean, in principle, we cannot rule out the case that the region of convergence may be closed. But uh, in this lag class, we usually see the Laplace transform uh, convert region of convergence as open sets. So even if ROC contains R1 intersecting R2, ROC usually it is still an open set, which can be shown by this example that by a couple of examples below. Let's first look at this example. What is Laplace transform of this signal? It has two terms and actually for each term, we have calculated Laplace transform and region convergence for a similar for signal with similar structure, at least the previous result here. Now as practice, I try to do it in two minutes and then we'll look at the result together. Okay, let's look at the result. So for the first term, we can apply the second case, right? Minus exponential minus a equals one t u of minus t. So for a equals one, we have one divided by s plus one. So for the first term, one divided by s plus one, region of convergence is 
So U of minus T is a left-sided signal. So the region of convergence is also to the left of the pole. The pole is minus one because it is what makes the denominator zero. And left-sided signal left to the left of the pole means less than the pole. We denote this by R1. So this is the ROC region of convergence for the first term, you see x of t. And for the second term, exponential minus 2t u of t, which is a right-sided signal applying the previous result, Laplace transform is one divided by s plus two, so right-sided, so it is to the right of the pole, larger than the pole. The pole is minus two, which is again what makes the denominator zero. Therefore, applying the linearity, the Laplace transform is the first term minus three times the second term. So the first Laplace transform capital X minus three times capital Y. Don't forget this linear coefficient three, which is the first term minus the second term times three. We can simplify it, but not simplify, we can merge them. The denominator has two factors, the numerator s plus two minus three times s plus one. This is the result. And for this Laplace transform, it has two poles, which can be observed from the denominator polynomial, right? s equals minus one, s equals minus two. Both of them can make the denominator zero, so it has. So the Laplace transform has two poles. And the region of convergence is actually between these two poles. In other words, it's a real part of S larger than minus two, less than minus one, as shown in this figure. Why? Because for the first term, Laplace transform to hold, it needs to be less than minus one, it needs to be left to minus one. For the second term to exist, it needs to be right to minus two. And for both terms to exist, we need to take the intersection of the two uh, regions, the intersection of R1, R2. The intersection is this, uh, is this region, this, this region between minus two and minus one. And in this case, the region of convergence for the linear combination equals R1 intersecting R2. So in general, it says can R I will say contains R1 intersecting in R2, but in this example, it is an exact equality. But is there an example where the strictly contains, which means R1 intersecting R2 is inside ROC? Yes, this is an example. So X of T, we consider X of T as a two as a signal composed of two terms. And we know from the previous result that for the first term, the Laplace transform is one divided by s plus four, right? And for the second term, exponential minus three t u of minus t. So previously in the result, if we have two minus signs, right? minus sign at the beginning and the u minus t, then it's one divided by s plus a. But here, the second term only has one minus sign in u of minus t. So the result has additional minus sign. This is minus sign here. One divided by s plus three. And the region of convergence for capital X needs to be the region of convergence for the first term intersecting the region of convergence for the second term because we, want, we need to make sure that both terms, the Laplace transforms exist. For the first term, since it's a right-sided right signal, then the Laplace transforms region of convergence should also be to the right of the pole. So it's larger than minus four. For the second term, the signal is left-sided. So the region of convergence is also left-sided, less than minus three. And the intersection between them is this region of convergence R1 for X. Now let's consider a different signal y, which is minus the exponential minus three t u of minus t. Actually y is just the second term of x with additional minus sign. 
and the result capital Y is one divided by S plus three using the previous result. Because small y is a left side signal, then capital Y is region of convergence is to the left of the pole, it's less than minus three. Now let's consider X plus Y. Applying linearity, it's Laplace transform is capital X plus capital Y. And then the summation of them two cancel the second term, one divided by S plus three. The result is one divided by S plus four. Notice that the result now only contains a first order polynomial in the denominator. In other words, there is a single pole minus four. And the region of convergence is actually real part of S larger than minus four. Why? Because if you look at small x plus small y, the second term cancel. And what is left is the first term, which is a right side signal. That's why the region of convergence is to the right of minus four. Now we can compare the region of convergence and R1 intersecting R2. R1, R2 already listed here. Notice that R1 itself is a subset of R2, right? R1 is smaller than R2. So R1 intersecting R2 equals the smaller set R1, which is between minus four and minus three. So this is R1 intersecting R2. But ROC is everything to the right of minus four, which is plotted in this figure. So the ROC actually contains R1 intersecting R2 strictly because R1 intersecting R2 is only this region between minus four and minus three. ROC is larger than it. This is an example that ROC strictly contains R1 intersecting R2. Although this example is constructed artificially, but this case indeed exists. So both this case and this case exist. The first case is exactly equality. The second case is it's strictly containing. So the pencil region, what I said is that the, the pencil region is a region that's larger than R1 intersecting R2. So it's larger than this part because this part is just a stripe between four, minus four and minus three. And this pencil region is larger than this. That's right, we need to determine case by case actually. Okay, let's look at another example of the uh, linearity of uh, Laplace transform. Uh, we have a signal X of T, which is exponential to T of a slow value. And we know that T of a slow value is a even signal and exponential to T of a slow value also even signal, which means it is symmetric over the vertical axis. And when t is larger than zero, then it's just exponential two t. When t is less than zero, it's exponential minus two t. And we use u of minus t to denote the part that is to the left of the vertical axis, because u of minus t is a left side step signal. u of t is the right side step signal. I use it to characterize the the part of x t when t is larger than t, zero, t is larger than zero. And if you plot x with t, it looks like this. And for this signal, try to calculate its Laplace transform using the previous result here and using the linearity because it's combination of two terms. Okay. I have two minutes. As exercise.
So a question from the chat window is what the pencil region is used for. In the last example, the pencil region, uh, so the pencil region is real part of S larger than minus four, real part of S larger than minus four, right? So it's the ROC. Will there be a signal with no ROC? Yes. Uh, if a signal, it turns out it has no ROC, then even the Laplace transform for that signal does not exist. Mm, C transform is you is not uh, intended for uh, the case where Laplace transform does not exist. It, it is for a, a different kind of signal, uh, which you will learn uh, in perhaps uh, later lecture. Okay. So let's look at the Laplace transform of the two terms respectively. For the first term, it's a left-sided signal. And the previous result again tells us if we have two minor signs, then the result is one divided by SD plus two. But since it has only one minor sign in U of minus T, then there is additional minor sign in front of one divided by S plus two. It's a left-sided signal, so the region of convergence is to the left of minus two. This is for the first term. For the second term, it's just as a standard u exponential minus a t u of t. So notice the sign here. It's a minus a t, then it's plus a here. So minus a here, plus a here, the different sign. So if it is two here, then we must have minus two here. So for the second term, the denominator is S minus two. And it is a right-sided signal, right? U of T is a right side. So the region of convergence is to the right of the pole. The pole is two because it is what makes the denominator zero. So to the right of the pole. Now this is what happens. The region of convergence for the first term need to be less than minus two. For the second term, it needs to be larger than two. And if we want the Laplace transform of X to exist, then both conditions should be satisfied, which is impossible, right? Because the intersection of these two sets is an empty set. There's no intersection with these two regions. In this case, the Laplace transform does not exist. Okay. Then look at another example, which is very similar to the last one, but the signal has a completely different structure. Last example, the signal ramps up to infinity to both directions, but this example, the signal converges to zero to both directions. It's exponential minus two T of a slow value. So the last example is plus two of a slow value. This is minus two. And we can represent it in terms of left side signal U of minus T, which is the left side exponential two T and right side signal U of T, which is on the right side exponential minus two T. And for this signal, try to write down its Laplace transform and specify the region of convergence. Right, for the last example, we cannot write down the Laplace transform because there's no valid region of convergence. The Laplace transform is only valid inside its region of convergence. but this example will be different.
So applying the previous result for the left side signal, the first term is this minor sign because uh, the standard result says two minor signs that only has one minor sign, so the other one need to be added here. Again, it's plus exponential plus two t here, so it's as minus two here. There is a change of the sign. It's a left sided signal, real part of s less than two to the left of the pole. And the second term, just applying the standard result, one divided by s plus two, it's a right sided signal, so the real part of s larger than minus two to the right of the pole, minus two. And this time, let's first look at the ROC. Again, for the Laplace transform of the combination of the two signals to exist, must make sure that both conditions, are both ROCs hold. And the intersection of both ROCs is larger than minus two, smaller than two, which is between minus two and two, that region. On that region, we can apply the linearity to get the Laplace transform of capital Y, uh, of, of small y, which is denoted by capital Y, which is the first term plus the second term. And we can merge the denominator and uh, calculate the numerator, which is here. Notice that the denominator has, can be factorized as, uh, as plus two, as minus two. So it has two poles plus and minus two and the region of convergence is between these two poles. This is a set of examples for us to, uh, to assist us understanding the linearity property. Now let's come to the next property, the convolution. We have two signals, h of t, x of t. There are Laplace transformers are respectively capital H and capital X, and the region of convergence are R1 and R2 respectively. Then if we have a new signal, Y of T, which is the convolution of X and H, actually this is commonly seen in, in uh, linear time invariant LTI systems. Then it's Laplace transform. The Laplace transform of Y is capital X times capital H as we derived before. And the region of convergence, same to the linearity property, it contains R1 intersecting R2. Now let's understand this property with an example. We have two signals. Both signals are combinations of delta T, the unit impulse response, and a right side exponential signal. Uh, we learned from last lecture that the Laplace transform of delta t is just of one everywhere on the 2D complex plane. So for all the s, and this is the result we will use multi, uh, multiple times. Uh, try to apply the convolution property to calculate the Laplace transform of x convoluting h. But try to do it yourself and we will review it in two minutes. Okay, the 
Laplace transform and of x and h can be calculated respectively. For x, the Laplace transform is just the Laplace transform of the two terms. For the first term, it's one. For the second term, applying the previous result is one divided by s plus two. The first term minus the second term, this is the result. And for x, it's ROC is the intersecting, is the intersection of ROC of the first term and the ROC of the second term. For the second term, since it's a right-sided signal, the region of convergence is larger than minus two. And for the first term, the region of convergence is all the S. So intersection with them is still larger than minus two. And similarly for H, the Laplace transform is the first term one plus the second term. So one divided by S plus one. And again, because the second term is a right-sided signal, its region of convergence is larger than or to the right of the pole minus one. And the region for the first term is all the S, so their intersection is the region of convergence of H, which is to the right of minus one. This is the Laplace transform and their respective region of convergence for the X and H respectively. And then X uh, converting H is Laplace transform is the multiplication of capital X and capital H. Uh, we'll we find that the numerator denominator doesn't cancel each other and result is one. And what is the region of convergence? Actually, you will find that the region of convergence is all the S because the denominator no longer exists. They are canceled. There is no pole. And this one is just valid for all the S. And you will see another uh, validation why the region of convergence is all the S because it turns out small x uh, converting small h is delta of t. And we know delta of t is region of convergence is all the S. This will be shown in the next slide. But let's stay at this slide for a little while because we want to look at the region of convergence and the relationship with the region of convergence of the convolution. ROC1 larger than minus two, ROC2 larger than minus one, their intersection is larger than minus two. This is the intersection of the two ROCs. But the ROC of the convoluted signal is all the S. So the ROC contains, strictly contains ROC1 intersecting ROC2 in this case. So this is strictly containing, okay. And this result can be obtained using alternative method without using the Laplace transform. Because in chapter two, we already learned how to calculate continuous time convolution. Now let's just calculate the continuous time convolution. The first term convoluting the second term. Remember that the convolution, the same to the standard multiplication, it has the commutative and the distributive properties, which means we can expand the factors, uh, uh, expand them. Delta of t, the first term, delta of t convoluting delta of t. Second term, exponential minus two t u t convoluting delta t. Third term, delta t convoluting exponential minus t u t. Last term, the convolution between these two. Right? Just a spread it as the multiplication. Then we learned in cha chapter two, so these are all the previous results we learned. Any signal x of t convoluting with delta t is itself. So the first term, the result is just delta t. The second term, the convolution is just this signal. Because convoluting with delta t is itself. The third term is this signal, exponential minus t u t, because convolution with delta t is itself. And then the last term, we did this example in chapter two. If I have two exponential signals with exponential coefficients minus alpha minus beta respectively, then and the, when alpha and beta are not equal, then their convolution 
is this. You can uh, check in the slides of chapter two. I will just apply this result. Here, alpha equals two, beta equals one. So that's the result is alpha equals two, beta equals one here. What we can find is that these two terms, the second, third term, and the last result exactly cancel. So they are all canceled out. What is left is delta t. As I said, the convolution of x, t, and h, t amazingly becomes delta t, a very simple signal. And we know that the Laplace transform of delta t is one for all the s. This is the result. We can compare this result with the result in the last page. Right? The Laplace transform of x convoluting h is one with ROC of the s. With two different methods, we obtain the same results. So by doing the right, the right thing. Okay. Uh, we have other properties like time shifting, time scaling. We will leave them for the next Wednesday lecture. A heads up is that next Friday, we will have the second uh, in-class test. Uh, this weekend, I will post the, uh, uh, the information for the test on Blackboard. Please check. Uh, basically, it will be uh, in the same format as the first uh, test. And for the second test, I decide to still use the open book, open notes, because it will, you will be examined a set of new knowledge. I know that you need time to get familiar with them. So open book, open notes, the details will be posted on Blackboard this weekend. Okay, this is the end of today's lecture. Uh, please stay for the TA's tutorial session uh, starting 10.30. Uh, I will see you next Wednesday. Thank you.